well in the sway of water. I'd see your father. 71 years ago, Eva Hart survived the sinking of the Titanic, but her father died in the disaster. Today, at a seance, she waits for a message from him. And your father is just as talkative as ever. I feel that uh, your father is so very, very close, and your mother also is looking very quietly. She's holding you close, and now she's putting you, taking you to put you to bed. I'd see your father. More than 1,500 people died that night in April 1912. Titanic was the biggest ship in the world. She'd been on her maiden voyage. For those who survived, such as Miss Hart, and Ruth Blanchard and Edwina McKenzie, life was never quite the same again. For years, Eva Hart's sleep was racked by nightmares. There was news. I was going down and down in this lifeboat and waiting for my father to come and never any sensation of being drowned. Just a nightmare of the whole terrible proceeding. You wouldn't like to hear the screams of women, would you? Or men and jumping into the water and screaming and there was no way to save them. People were screaming and screaming, and uh, then all was silent. The silence was terrible. Yet the tragedy that scarred and killed so many could have been avoided. No one knows exactly how many people died that night. Some say 1,503, others 1,522. Millionaires and their retinues, young men with their eyes set on opportunity, needy emigrants seeking a new world. The disaster shocked society because they'd said Titanic was unsinkable. The owners, the Anglo-American White Star Line, were to declare even two months after the great liner had sunk. The ship was looked upon as practically unsinkable. She was looked upon as being a lifeboat in herself. On the anniversary of the sinking, the survivors gathered in Philadelphia. Eva Hart came 3,000 miles from Chadwell Heath near London. Members only. It's a convention of the Titanic Historical Society, a group of enthusiasts for whom Titanic holds a recurring fascination. Telephone calls from people who wish to join the society. And if I could have your name. We want to make sure you have your card back here the program. It fascinates me. It's very dramatic, very romantic, very melodramatic. And uh, aside from the fact that it's a great tragedy, many people died, there is still something that draws you to it. I think that this whole thing about all these people being on this one ship, and I think we tend to project ourselves onto the ship. We want to be John Jacob Astor, and we want to be Ben Guggenheim. So we're getting into those boats, literally getting into the boats. You know. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Right. Edwina McKenzie, who's 98, traveled from California to attend the convention. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I've been obsessed with it since I was a child, and uh, I feel very personally about it, almost religious. It's a spiritual thing for me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be it, and then I'm going to have to ask them to join. Five survivors are there. George Thomas traveled from Michigan. Thank you very much. Steve, you look pretty good. Thank you. Oh, I never thought I would see the day when I would meet one of these people. <laughs> it's like meeting a movie star or the president. Yeah. It's very gratifying. <laughs> My grandmother's boyfriend went down on the Titanic. Quig Baxter, he was in the first class. Could be I walked the decks of the ships in a previous life for all I know, but it always has been of interest to me. Since when? Uh, I read the book uh, when I was nine years old. Now, is there anything else in your life about which you could say that? Not really. No. The death of Titanic has given birth to a multitude of books and films and legends. The facts are extraordinary enough. Same book. The Titanic is the greatest example of if anything bad could happen, it will. Nothing went right for her. On the, if anything could have gone wrong, it did. She didn't see the berg in time. She hit it the way it was most vulnerable to her. There weren't enough lifeboats for everybody. People didn't believe it was sinking, so they wouldn't get in the lifeboats. The nearest ship, her wireless operator, was asleep. Anything could have gone wrong, it did. More than 400 people attend the convention. The highlight, a banquet. The menu, breast of chicken white star, with chocolate mousse Titanic to follow.
3,000 miles away from all this, one of the last surviving members of the crew, Frank Prentice. Prentice, from Bournemouth, was 18 when Titanic sank. He was a stores clerk, an assistant to the purser. To be chosen by the White Star Line to crew Titanic was an honour. Frank Prentice joined her in Southampton just before she sailed. You see this huge thing with four funnels? I thought she was something out of the ordinary, my gosh. Bigger than you'd expected? I didn't quite know what to expect. She was the last word in luxury. All her public rooms were absolutely amazing. All the woodwork was beautifully carved and she had everything. Everything that you could think of. That they, she was a beautiful ship. How many days uh, did you have to familiarize yourself with the Titanic between the time you arrived and the time that you left Southampton? Uh, about three days. Was that enough? Well, you couldn't, you wanted a, a week to go all around the Titanic. Did you have any lifeboat drill? We had no lifeboat drills. Uh, and the list of lifeboats, I believe, was put up in the galley about uh, the day that we struck an iceberg. Nobody knew where their boats were. Lifeboats were a thing that they weren't necessary. You see, we were, we were on a ship that was unsinkable. The Titanic was born here at Howland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, Northern Ireland. She was one of a pair of sister ships being built simultaneously. The Titanic and the Olympic. They towered side by side above the concrete slipways as high as 15-storey skyscrapers covered in a tracery of steel supports. They built special slipways a quarter of a mile long. The men who worked there 80 years ago poured into Titanic and Olympic their pride and expertise, as they recalled 60 years later. I would say that the Titanic was the last word in craftsmanship in shipbuilding craftsmanship. A lovely ship, one of the greatest ships I ever want to see. Lovely, all good commendations and everything, so the for the passengers that was going on it. She was a lovely ship and well built. There hasn't been anything like it done since. So beautiful and technically sound, built with 16 watertight compartments, designed to make her, in practical terms, unsinkable. Any two of these bulkheads could be breached and Titanic would stay afloat. And so the legend of invincibility grew. In 1911, they built this model of Titanic as part of a publicity drive. Titanic's job was to capture a hefty share of the transatlantic market for White Star, to persuade those who were emigrating from Europe or traveling on holiday or on business to use White Star rather than, say, Cunard. The market was enormous. Uh, first of all, there was the cream of the market, the, the first-class passengers. And White Star, I think, was probably, with the Olympic and Titanic, uh, moving into the, the top upmarket position, because the new ship is always the one that gathers the fashionable passenger clientele. The steerage passengers, which was the emigrant trade across the North Atlantic, was colossally big. Uh, if you consider the multi-millions of people that traveled from all over Europe, many through Mediterranean or United Kingdom ports to United States and Canada, you will see that very many ships, ship owners and the crews and officers of the ships made a living from taking these people across the Atlantic. Titanic set out from Southampton on April 10th, 1912. She'd cost more than a million pounds to build. She was licensed to carry 3,500 passengers. She was to live only four days. The Hart family were off to start a building business in Canada, but Eva's mother was worried. My mother, who had been very apprehensive about the whole thing and didn't want to go, I had this very firm premonition of trouble of some kind, but she really didn't know what it was. But the moment she knew that we were going in the Titanic, she said, ah, now I know why I'm frightened. And that is because this ship was declared by the builders to be unsinkable. And her expression was that that was flying in the face of God. Flying in the face in the of? In the face of God. 
But of course my father poo-pooed this idea, and of course my mother agreed to go. As we got to the gangplank to go aboard, she stopped, put her hand on his arm, and she said, I will ask you just once more, will you please not go? And he said, no, I'm going. Having left Southampton, she called at Cherbourg on the evening of April 10th, and then made for Queenstown in Ireland. A couple of tenders came out with uh, passengers and a male and a little bit of specie, gold and silver bars, you know. What to take to America? Yes. The Titanic left Ireland on April the 11th. She'd picked up more passengers and she now carried more than 2,200 men, women and children. Edwina Mackenzie was 27. She was off to visit her sister. We had a very wonderful cabin. It had uh, two bunks and a couch in it. And I, uh, the couch was turned into a bed at night and I had the couch for my bed. They uh, had many card parties and, and get people acquainted. We had de deck courts and, and they did all they could to make you happy. <laughs> and were you happy? A very happy girl, very happy. Throughout the voyage, the sea was to be calm, the weather clear. Ruth Blanchard, who's now 83, was taking the last leg of a voyage from India. My father was a missionary, but my little brother, who was two years old, was sick, and the doctors told mother that uh, he wouldn't live if we stayed in India. I guess it was because the Titanic just happened to be going when we wanted to go. George Thomas, then seven, had set out only three weeks before by camel from his family's village in the Lebanon. My sister used to play every day. We would play, we'd go upstairs ways, and then come back down, and here and there, and there was a cabin next door to us, a vacant cabin. We would play there most of the time. By the second day, Titanic was in mid-voyage. She'd already received a number of ice warnings. Eva Hart's mother had decided never to sleep at night. I slept firmly all the daytime and sat up at night reading, doing crochet, doing needlework. And she would put on a thick woolen dress and all her clothes, and in those days there were a lot of other clothes, and she would sit there, literally waiting. Titanic was taking the southerly of the two regular routes across the Atlantic. At this time of year, captains knew that icebergs were drifting south, having broken away from the ice cap. Instead of going straight, we used to go around like that, you see. Further south? Yes. Why? Why? To get away from icebergs. Early on April 14th, the third day of the voyage, Titanic received the first of a series of ice warnings. 9 a.m. SS Coronia, westbound steamer, reports bergs, growlers and field ice in 42 degrees north from 49 degrees to 51 degrees west. and we had lots of toys and there was a beautiful shop and my father was always buying things for me and I had other children to play with. I had a terribly pleasant time, I loved it. At 1.42 on April 14th, from the steamer Baltic, Greek steamer Athenae reports passing icebergs and large quantity of field ice. The atmosphere was one gay party. They were enjoying life, and they should do. They had everything, the finest food they ever could be prepared for them, and all the luxury of having wonderful public rooms to go to, orchestra, dancers. From the SS America via Cape Race at 1.45 p.m. Past two large icebergs in 41.27 north, 58 west. dining room it was beautiful you know that new silver everything was new and uh, now queer part of it was the only, the dining room was the only part of the ship that I remember <laughs> from the SS Californian at 7:30 p.m. three large icebergs five miles to south of us oh they had a fine time I'm sure they all enjoyed it from SS Masaba to Titanic much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs also field ice. You could smell ice. I, I knew it because you can smell it. What do you mean? Keenness, a keenness in the air. There's some 
something about ice that you can smell. From the SS Californian again, an hour before the collision. We are stopped and surrounded by ice. The Titanic responded, shut up, I'm busy. Titanic was now travelling faster than at any other time in the three days since she'd left Ireland. The ship was travelling, we understand, at about 22 knots. That is nearly 25 miles an hour. Uh, and for motorists, that gives a fair impression of speed. Uh, if you were to consider the speed your car is doing as you're approaching the 30 mile an hour limit. And remember that the ship is weighing something in the region of uh, 35,000 tons, possibly more, with water alongside, uh, moving with it. Quite difficult to stop. Definitely in excess of speed. Weather was perfect. Absolutely calm and we were flat out. We were out to break a record. Being a maiden voyage, they may well have been trying to get a convenient docking time in New York to suit the passengers and to get maximum publicity. I was talking to a pal of mine, he was sitting on my bunk. All of a sudden, she came to a halt. There was no fuss. It was like putting your brakes on a car and you gradually came to a halt. And I went for it on the uh, promenade deck and I looked down I couldn't see any, any damage at all above the waterline. But what I did see was ice in the well deck, the forward well deck. And I thought, hello, we've hit an iceberg. She said she didn't know what it was, but she knew it was this terrible something that had been hanging over her for weeks. What it was, precisely, she neither knew nor cared. It was it. And I saw the purser. And uh, I said, Mr. McElroy, if I can do any good, you let me know. If the best thing you can do is get back into bed, you catch your death of cold. My father uh, picked me up out of bed, wrapped a blanket around me, carried me, and put me down with my mother by an iceboat. And he said, now, don't move from here. Whatever anyone says, don't move. The drop from the boat deck to the water was about between 70 and 80 feet and you could hardly see the water, and people didn't want to go. They, they got in their minds she was unsinkable. The officers didn't know whether it will sink or not, whether it, uh, it could still float. So uh, he said, all we can do is go in the cabin and pray. By then, the captain had ordered out lifeboats and women and children. Lower the lifeboats and stand by. That was the order. Stand by. He put me in the lifeboats and he put my mother in and he said to me, now you look after your mother. And I looked up as this boat went down the side. It's a terribly long way down to that dark sea. I remember looking up and seeing him leaning over, saying, be good, look after mummy. And that was the last I saw of him. He made no attempt to get in the boat at all. It was so sad to have to take the the wives away from their husbands and leave the husbands up on deck. And I knew that she was sinking then. And I knew what chances we were just waiting for death. At 2.20 a.m. on April 15th, Titanic sank. News of the disaster filtered through by the newfangled radio to the outside world, to America, where at first the reports comforted. Then, the enormity of the tragedy began to emerge. In England, in Titanic's home port, Southampton, whole streets went into mourning. They held two inquiries into why it had happened. The first was in America, the second in London. They said Titanic had been going too fast and that she'd ignored ice warnings, that the crew had been unfamiliar with each other and there'd been no lifeboat drill for passengers or crew and that the watertight compartments that had made the unsinkable ship unsinkable had failed. The watertight compartments had not proved truly watertight for two reasons. First, the bulkheads extended to varying heights because they joined decks that ran through the ship at varying levels. Second, they were linked to decks that were by no means watertight. And however watertight the bulkheads, a compartment is not watertight if the top lets in water. What had happened then 
was that as the Titanic went down by the head, the water filled and spilled over into each subsequent watertight compartment, and so on until the end. And crucially, the inquiries agreed that when the disaster had occurred, there'd been too few lifeboats to carry the passengers and crew to safety. Rightly or wrongly, the captain of the Titanic, Captain Smith, was blamed particularly by the Americans for the fact that Titanic was traveling too fast. Rightly or wrongly, the captain of the Californian, Captain Lord, was blamed by both inquiries for failing to come quickly to the rescue of the stricken liner. And to tidy matters up, the British wrote new rules to ensure that never again would a liner put to sea with too few lifeboats to rescue all who sailed in her. But for the 1,500 men, women and children who died in the Titanic, it was all too late. Seventy years later, it all seemed so obvious. If a ship carries 3,500 people, she needs seats for every one of them in a lifeboat. So why did the Titanic sail with places for only 990, plus 188 in collapsible dinghies? A situation that, in the event of disaster, must mean that 2,300 people would be left behind. Well, firstly, because White Star Line were required by law to carry no more than that. The lifeboats were full, and there were still over 1,500 people left behind. And the panic then must have been dreadful. We could hear it, of course, from the boats. We had people screaming and running side to side of the ship. And uh, you see, it was just a question of who was there. If you weren't there, by the time someone went and waited you up and you got up on deck, there wasn't a lifeboat to get in. It was just one mad rush to get into them, into the lifeboat. I was thrown in. I mean, you know, he just picked me up and threw me in. There was a man with a baby and they said, stand back, stand back. We thought, I don't want to be saved, we'll save the baby. So I said, I would. So I had the baby all night in my arms. We got the four boats away and they were trying to jump into them as they went down and all the boats had gone then. I got separated from my mother. I was lifted up by somebody and put over into another boat, which was a terrifying thing. I thought I was being thrown over the side. The decks were lined with people not getting off. They were lined with people looking over the railing. So when the boat then when the water rushed into the boilers, there was a terrible explosion. And that's when I thought the boat broke in half. And that's when the people started jumping into the water and screaming. That's when they, that's when they screamed. It was terrible. Screamed for the women, you know, and all. Frank Prentice, then 18, climbed the steeply sloping deck. He perched on the stern of Titanic and looked down. There was so much debris floating and bodies dead and alive were all around there. So there were hundreds of them around the stern of that ship. They'd all seem to drift it down that way. They were, had two boards on the stern of the Titanic, which said, keep clear of propeller blades. And I was on the port one, hanging on. And eventually I slid off. And I had a life jacket on and I hit the water with a true crash. But I didn't hit anything in the water. I was lucky, very lucky. When we rode out, I don't know how far it was, uh, but it was beautiful, just a beautiful sight. It was, uh, all the lights were on in the Titanic and uh, it was listing just a little bit in the front, you know, going down. But it was a beautiful sight. Cold, it was freezing. That's what killed everybody. They didn't last long. You see, a lot of them went over with heart their clothes on. They didn't last long. Anyway, when I I found Ricks, and uh, he'd hurt himself. He'd hurt his legs. He dropped on something, and he didn't say very much. He was a great big fella too. Very good swimmer. And uh, he died, and I've, I was eventually, I seemed to be all by myself. 
the cries of help and prayers had all subsided and everything was quiet. And then we looked back and the lights were gone and, and uh, the sun was over with, just like that, you know. And, uh, and it's just a few minutes and there was nobody there anymore. And when it's over and, and these people are dead and that drowning is, the screams have stopped, it is a dreadful silence. It's as if the whole world stands still. In New York, the next of kin waited anxiously for news and the post-mortem began. The US Senate inquiry said that the White Star liner had been navigated without due care. Titanic was going faster than at any other time in the voyage and they questioned company chairman Bruce Ismay's role in the disaster. They blamed the nearby Californian, hove to in the ice, for failing to come to Titanic's rescue. And they blamed the British government's board of trade for obsolete and antiquated shipping laws. The British inquiry was held here in the London Scottish Hall around the corner from Buckingham Palace. In many ways, it was a whitewash, a cover-up. Despite the death of 1,500 people on June 5, 1912, in evidence to the British inquiry, Harold Sanderson, director of the White Star Line, declared, I still do not feel that it would be a wise or necessary provision to provide boats for everybody on board ship. To understand this extraordinary statement made even after the worst disaster in maritime history, it's necessary to understand what had been White Star's attitude to lifeboats. Lifeboats, according to Ismay and Sanderson, had been necessary only if the Titanic had broken down. Then they'd have been needed to ferry passengers from an unsinkable Titanic to the rescuing vessels that would have hurried to her aid. Besides, the Titanic had complied with the law, and that was that. Yet, to do merely what the law requires isn't always enough. We know now that the unsinkable could sink. And what if there'd been a fire and it had swept through the ship? Where would the passengers have found refuge then without enough lifeboats to flee in? That winter, the Olympic, the Titanic sister ship, slipped quietly back into Harland and Wolf shipyard here in Belfast for a refit. New as she was, on the orders of the owners, there were alterations that simply had to be made. They extended the watertight bulkheads so that they met the underside of a watertight deck. If that had happened in the Titanic, she would have survived much longer, possibly have totally survived. They extended the double bottom of the vessel so that it formed a double skin as far as the waterline. It would undoubtedly have helped her to stay afloat longer. And they increased the number of lifeboats by four times, to 68. Everybody who was alive after the impact with the iceberg would have been saved. After Titanic, never again were vessels permitted to travel across the Atlantic so far north when ice was breaking and drifting. After Titanic, regular lifeboat drills became compulsory. After Titanic, there was a place for everyone, passengers and crew, in the lifeboats. After Titanic, Bruce Ismay retired from the chairmanship of White Star and from public life. He had a lot of people on board, and there must have been a lot of pockets of air, and they must have suffered more than I did, I imagine. Gradually dying, because there were bulkheads all over their place. And people, some of them, didn't leave their cabins even. And they must have died in their cabins. And, and they must have had a lingering death. It was almost like murder, wasn't it? They had no lifeboats to look after them. Border trade were equally to blame for allowing a ship of that description to leave port with 16 lifeboats, which could only save the crew. She was so unsinkable that it wasn't true. On the anniversary of the death of Titanic, the Titanic Historical Society hold a memorial service. They sing again the hymn played as the ship went down. They 
called the disaster an act of God. Was it not much more the result of the foolishness of man?